Quincy and DeAndre. Quincy and DeAndre, how are y'all? How are you, hey, Samson? What's up, Samson? My heart. I have to ask y'all the question that we ask everybody who comes on, and that is, how long have y'all been together, and how did y'all first meet? 25 years. This is our 25th year together. I forget. Yeah, no, I know it's over 23. It's 25 <laughs> years, Quincy Gospel. Uh, we met as actors. Uh, we met as actors through mutual friends when we were closeted. Uh, and they, they had no idea that they were introducing, you know, a, 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 a future couple. These two closeted guys meeting each other, how did y'all know that each other was gay? It was complicated. I don't think I knew right away. I knew that I had, I knew that I, I liked him, but I didn't know where his T was, as they say. And um, he was actually, he was not paying me any attention when we first met. I just thought, oh, this guy's really cute. Because our friend was like, you know, this guy I met named Quincy, he reminds me of you. This is my friend from college who was a filmmaker. He was like, I really want you guys to meet because you guys are actors. I, I think you guys could do something, both of you are writers. It was just most, mostly like a business collaboration of, of minds he was trying to facilitate. But when I met him, I was like, oh, hey, how you doing? But I couldn't say anything, but he was, he was completely, he was not interested. Quincy, he says that you kind of ignored him for a little while. So let's get into that. What was it that finally made you give him some attention? Well, number one, I was in a relationship. I was I was in a relationship with uh, a young lady um, back home who I intended to marry um, and move to Los Angeles and start a family. So um, I put it on him. I'm just kidding. I got so disrespectful. I was, I was literally <laughs> like, I had my blinders on. You know, I was not paying attention to, to him, to guys, to anything. Like literally, I, I, I think for me, um, it was one of those things where I was trying to force myself to be the person I was expected to be. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I, I, I think I functionally put on those blinders too. Uh, any type of attractions that I that I may have had to to men at the time, and so you know, and I'm 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 a one I'm a one person person. So I'm in a relationship. I'm committed. I'm trustworthy. I love her. This is this is it. So I wasn't paying attention to him in that way. So it was like, cool, nice to meet you. You you know, nice guy, talented guy. You know, cool. <laughs> no, so I mean, he's he kept coming around, right? Because he kept coming around with um his his best friend who was now a writing partner with my roommate so i you know it may be a, a matter of like a few months or so we kept being around each other and then we had to do this project together and i think during the project was when i i you know i i recognized that i had a little crush and uh just i don't know i i, I entertained it I was 2,000 miles away from home. Um, I was on my own. There was no one in, in LA who knew who knew me uh, or knew anything about my background. And it was kind of like a, a moment that I was probably given the freedom to explore myself and be uh, myself and stand in my truth at the time. Uh, finding myself attracted to this man. Don't say um, like that. I, I just gave it a try. I was like, oh, what the getting, heck? He what said, the hell? What the heck? <laughs> what was it that what was it about him that really drew you in and said made you go, I want a relationship with this man? It was, you know, I know some people say, you know, I don't believe in love at first sight, but I do know really early on when I'm getting reciprocity. And that was huge for me. So I was the guy that was you know, I went from guy to guy and I, I was not in, I, at the time I was so in the closet and so deeply conflicted with my sexuality that I thought the only thing that I could do with other guy is do that, you know, get my rocks off and then move on about life, you know, and move through life as if I'm straight. And so I never really entertained a boyfriend, though I had had one before him. Mm -hmm. But it was very tumultuous. He was in the closet. He had a girlfriend. It was very painful. And I told myself I was never going to put myself in that position again. Yeah. And I also learned a lot from that relationship about what I wanted. And right away with this one, it was just it was reciprocity. Like he made the effort like 
even when I was doing my little hitting and quidditch, I was the one putting in the most effort for it. almost everybody I had laid down with. I was like calling, what you doing? You want to hang out? Nobody it seemed like my phone never rang. I was always the one that was the pursuer. And so with him, you know, though I, I was doing a lot of the pursuing, at least he called me back. And at least sometimes he called without me, without a solicitation. And so I, I, and he would make the effort, you know, he'd make plans with me like, hey, what are you doing on this day? And I'm like, oh, okay. And it just felt very um, mutual. The, the attraction, the, 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 uh, the attention, the, uh, the respect, it was very mutual. And so I knew this was something different, though it scared the shit out of me because yeah, yeah. I was I had told myself, uh-uh, this no, and I'm not I'm not gonna get hurt again. You know what I mean? So yeah, th- uh, here I is 25 years right. later. So apparently. Tell us about this journey out of the closet. What was that like? I was I was put out the closet. So for me, <laughs> yeah. So for me, again, some of these guys I pursued. So I was a, I was a musical theater geek. I traveled in a musical theater company and there was this guy and I don't want to incriminate him. So I won't say, you know, any specifics, but there was this guy I liked and I had made a move on him because I thought I was feeling the same vibe from him. And he, you know, he sort of like backed off and I was like, oh shit, what have I done? And so I begged him, please do not tell anybody that this happened. In my mind, this was like, death to people to find out what who I truly was. So I begged him, don't tell anyone. And I'd say maybe four or five months later, this this group of mutual friends who were in this musical theater company, two of them were my high school friends who knew me really well and did know my teeth. And uh but straight guys and always protected that secret fiercely. They were at this <clears throat> this uh party or something for this group of people. And this guy had told one of my best friend's girlfriends, you know, uh, he started outing a whole bunch of, a handful of people that he knew that were gay. So immediately my, both of my boys called me and said, like, listen, I just want you to know we're here. Somebody's talking about your sexuality and it was not us. And mm-hmm. they told me who it was. And I was like, this mm-hmm. motherfucker. <laughs> I hope you whooped his ass. No, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> no, what I did, what I did, I got, I got, it, I resolved in myself and what, I was angry and I was trying to figure out how to lie to, to, to beat this, this rumor that was spreading. And I was thinking of all these things I was going to say and something resolved in me and said, DeAndre, it's true. So it doesn't matter. Why would you, it's the truth. So instead of calling this fool and cussing him out, I called my mother and I said, mom, I'm gay. And she was like, I know. <laughs> She's like, I know. I'm just waiting for you to know. <laughs> and I was like, what? Wow. <laughs> yeah, so that was that was my coming out. Of course, I asked my mom not to tell anyone, and she told the whole family. But it wasn't even 20 minutes after I got off the phone. My aunt was calling. My uncle was calling. I love you just the way you are. I, you know, and you don't ever have to be afraid to tell me this. And, you know, you're a good person, and you've always done well for yourself. And so that gave me the strength to kind of walk in my own two shoes, but it still would be about seven or eight years before I came out like in the greater world. Quincy has, Quincy has- but, a- Well, I'm not going to go through the whole <laughs> whole journey. Uh, but yeah, I was still in the closet. You know, I felt like out of sight, out of mind. I was 2000 miles away and I was able to, you know, be in this relationship with him without having to inform, you know, anyone. Um, And I think after a while, that just became a little overwhelming because I started to feel like my relationships with my friends and my family just were uh, strained because I had this secret. And, you know, you get to a point where you're like, I'm a grown ass man. Nobody's paying my bills. (laughs) You know what I mean? I can't call home for a loan no more. And I'm tired of, you know, running into the guest room when y'all come visit because now we got to pretend like we're roommates. Right. Um, and for me, that was really the biggest, like the, the, the moment of just, I'm tired. You know, I'm tired of living for everybody else and, 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 and making myself uncomfortable. Um, so I'm just going to, I'm just going to, say it. I'm just going to say it. And so um, that's when I called my parent, you know, well, I called my dad. And I came out to my dad and he said the very same thing. He always knew. He was just waiting for me to say it. And I'm like, what the 
I don't know, we're talking about y'all always knew. <laughs> then why was you pushing me off? Exactly. Well, why you let me? Why would you let me live in this closet like this for all these years? You right. know, and and pretend in front of you when you felt the complete opposite. Uh, but in, in industry wise, career career wise, we remained like closeted. Um, and eventually, I I came out to my mom, and my mom is like his mom. Their Twitter before there was a Twitter. <laughs> Um, right. <laughs> and so, although, you know, you tell them something, you ask them to keep it in confidence, but within 24 hours, the whole South side of Chicago <laughs> knew I was gay, but it actually wasn't until we created the deal Chronicles that we both fully came out because yeah. we had created this show based off of, you know, loosely based off of our personal experiences. And also of, you know, stories and experiences of people we had encountered as well. A lot of it still was fictional, but here we are representing this show that is about black men who feel compelled to hide their truths, but yet we're representing it, pretending to be straight men. Wow. Like, so that was like, but you know, even before like we it, it ended up on the air or anything, we, we, we realized at that point, like, we can't do that. Like that that's like we can't be hypocrites. You know what I mean? Like this so the show literally was was our, was was our, our public, declaration. public declaration. Like, yes, and we are a couple and we are gay men who, you know, lived in the closet as roommates, <laughs> as best friends and as roommates for the past seven years. So that's and 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 honestly, the show is is what actually exposed us to the gay community abroad because I was not ever a part of the gay community. So I remember first seeing it uh, in October of 2008 at the Lincoln Theater in DC. Oh, uh, really? Uh, you, were you got the date? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I, I would never forget it because I mean at the time there were no gay films. There were not, there weren't that many gay television shows and so I was out, but I mean, back then, you know, you had to know how to fight. <laughs> right, right. So I remember going to the Real Affirmations Film Festival in D.C. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, it was a theater full of white folks, old white men. Mm -hmm. And me and about 12 black folks, we just were looking for each other in the theater. We found each other and we all sat in the back. And I just remember we literally all were holding hands watching it. And it was oh, it was wow. a moment. It was definitely a moment. Wow. Wow. That's crazy. That's amazing. As the creators of this show, which is iconic, it will forever be iconic in the black gay community. Thank you. What was the feedback like? And and how how transformative was that for you both individually and as a couple? Stepping oh, into being out black gay men. The first thing was, and see, again, we, we didn't know the community, so we didn't know how hot button the topic this, this term in, in of itself was, like politically, you know, really heavy. And so actually the first reaction from our film was, I don't want to fucking see that shit. You know, everybody was like, fuck the DL, we don't want to see this, why do we keep talking about this? There are plenty of stories to talk about. Yeah, yeah stop stereotyping our community out, with this DL talk, stuff. Can we talk about out and open relationships, that kind of thing. But that was before they had seen a single frame of the films. That This was just off the title alone. So I don't know. It was like a bunch what, of bloggers back then too. Like bloggers, that, that was the blogger sphere period where bloggers were the go-to people um, online. For our content. Yeah. The and yeah. so the, the bloggers were trashing us yeah. up but front, they but they had it. never seen it. Once they got there, the response to this very day has constant sometimes has made us emotional because we were we were trying to tell a story that was about us and it was in response to sort of like the monolithic monolithic view of dl men uh off an of episode we saw oprah and we were trying to open up this conversation and like not paint black men who are in the closet as these shady deceiving aids giving characters and talk mm -hmm. about the reasons they choose this and are, I feel they have to choose this, but also inside of the episode, find ways or give them hope of ways to find their way to their truth. And so uh, when people would see that and saw our intent, you could feel the intent behind, even though it was called Dio Chronicles, it is like trying to open a door for your way 
to the light, so to speak. And so men were telling us all over the country because this it was a cult hit immediately. Oh, yeah. And uh, we were getting emails of men saying, this saved me from suicide. This saved my, you know, my parents had put me out. And I, I watched this with my mom and she suddenly understood me a little better than she had before. To this very day, people are still discovering these old episodes on, you know, here TV has renewed it and re, uh, remastered it and put it back out. So there's a new generation discovering it. We're still getting hit up. And I, it's sort of, it's, it's great, but it's sort of like heart, it, it sort of hurts because I feel like I wish we were still further along, but I'm still hearing the same stories that I heard in the early 2000s. I'm still hearing mm-hmm. those same stories from the same men of color that they're still, they're still struggling through. They're this. still, yeah, you know, as, as out and open as the world is today, and as far along as we've come as black uh, queer people, which, you know, still not not as far along as let's say the white queer community has has been but there's still i think people forget because they're now used to seeing openly gay men i mean now we got Lil Nas X now we got you know uh what's his oh, name Santana Santana yeah. you know we got you know Santa. Frida we got we got you know we got all of these people um and you would uh, think oh nobody's in the closet anymore <laughs> Like nobody's living that life, and you know, so is the DL something that is is over, is done and over? You know, that's that's old school, but we're still literally receiving the same the emails same that, emails that and messages and comments on YouTube and stuff, and it's like, wow, this is still um largely, you know, maybe not as as largely as it was, but it is still a sect of our community and and. Um, black community, Latino community, um, Caribbean, Af- especially in Africa. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like we get we get international messages from people. So there are still people who, you know, even today in LA, in Hollywood, disproportionately, it's happening. Yeah, people of color. That's what I want to point out. It's not like these are always black men or men of color that we're getting. Into. Another iconic thing that y'all did was. Uh, Y'all were a part of the marriage ceremony at the Grammys in 2014 with Queen Latifah officiating, which was something else y'all did that was huge. The community was totally cheering y'all on. But another part of that conversation is we don't get to see a lot of openly Black gay couples in media loving each other, staying together. And y'all are, again, one of our couples. So why is that type of visibility important? And being a part of that ceremony, what was that like? And what was the impact that you think it had on the Black community? Hugely important. You know, Quincy and I, we had planned on getting married. And, you know, when that, when that, when that uh, event came about, when the casting directors were con- contacting us, initially we said no, because we felt like it was going to be a spectacle, like we were going to be made. I just did, it didn't feel serious enough for us and they didn't give us many details. But eventually when we got more details and realized how when we talked amongst ourselves, we realized how important it was not only for us, but for folks watching, you know, and a lot of the work, again, we've been sort of, we sort of been the sacrificial lambs in, in a small way to kind of like put ourselves out there so that young people that see us feel like there's a way to live and thrive and you know and and it being who exactly who i am and also trying to be those people we wish we had seen when we were struggling with ourselves so we're all we're not we're not afraid of that but we just were you know just wanted to be careful that this wasn't something that was going to be some kind of fodder so we we after we got details we did it it was extremely important and i and and again a lot of responses from the community for that that uh standing up and doing that for the you know for the for the public also with with the grammy wedding when we found out what it was because like he said they wouldn't tell they just told us it was for television and we were like we're we we at the time we were television producers and we're like and we produced you know competition you know non-scripted stuff and we're like uh i'm not trusting being you know, my wedding, a big moment for that to be in the hands of some television producers for, you know, we we know what goes down as far as decisions on how people are portrayed and how they bend storylines and get exploited for ratings. Although we never produce any kind of shows like that. We only did 
competition, you know, talent shows. But we we know that world, and we're like, we're not about to be, you know, made fools of um, on national TV. When we found out that that it was the Grammys, that changed the, that changed everything. We're like, oh wow. Then I became afraid because I'm like, although you know we're recognizable within our community there's a safety to being recognized amongst your peers you know what i'm saying by other black men other black gay men um but you know we're we're protected here we're safe here this is mainstream broadcast across the world this is now putting our lives um in to become subject to a lot of hatred. Yeah. Um, like, trust me, the DL Chronicles got us some hate mail. It definitely yeah, got us some hate mail. We got some, we've gotten some horrible shit sent our way um, by crazy people. So I'm thinking just that little bit off of, off of a project and off of, you know, recognition that just really kind of, you know, uh, secluded in our own community. Now we are about to be on national TV, on the Grammys, in front of 40 million plus people saying our lives matter, our marriage, our love matters. And what crazy person, crazy people are going to find our fucking addresses and be standing outside of our house? So it was a lot of stuff to consider because that, you know, it, it wasn't a small statement to make, especially on the Grammys. That that was a big consideration was like, I don't know if I want to do that. I don't, you know, I don't know if I want to put my life at risk for for this. I don't know if I need to 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 make a political statement, right? You know, with with my my wedding cuz I don't know if I'm, I I I don't know if I can step into those shoes. It's the difference between like, yeah, I support the community, I support this, I support that, but are you the person who's willing to stand in front of a possible gun for your beliefs. And I don't shame anybody who is like, ah, I'm not quite ready to be that person. And so that was a big conversation we had to have. And because it was so frightening, like we just didn't know what the response, I have learned that sometimes the greatest reward or the thing that you need to free yourself is on the other side of that fear. Yeah. So sometimes the fear is literally the indicator that this is the direction you need to go in because what you need is on the other side of that fear. And so I think for, for me was like, if it's making me this afraid and it's keeping me up at night, it's something that I need to do.